shield to me. It is protection for me. Wisdom will help me discern what's good in my life and what's bad in my life. You will help me discern what's poisonous and what's righteous. You're going to help me find life and life more abundantly in the name that is above every name. This is a night that we will forever remember when we began to enter into mentorship and discipleship. This is going to be life changing in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Are y'all ready to go? Are y'all ready to go back there? We ready to go? If you are watching online right now, then you need to be tuned in just like we are. Get a Bible, get a notepad, get a pen, and get ready to write down everything you can. Because this is a time of mentorship, and it is a time of instruction. Your future is determined by your mentor. Show me your mentor, and I will show you your future. We tell that the teens all the time, that I can predict your future by looking at your mentor. Here's one of the first notes I want you to write down. I want you to write down, I have gone as far as I can with my current level of knowledge. I have gone as far as I can with my current level of knowledge. I want you to think about that for a second. Everything that you've been able to accomplish, everything you've done so far, you have done with your current level of knowledge. Meaning, if you want to do anything else, if you aspire to anything greater in your life, it is going to require an increase of knowledge. It's going to require an increase of knowledge that is beyond your reach, that is going to require some assistance. It's going to require a pursuit of wisdom. The Bible says that wisdom is the principal thing. Everybody say that. Wisdom is the principal thing. So important for you to understand. So important for you to remember. Principal thing, that means first fruits. What that means is the first thing you seek when you are seeking after something from God, he says, should be wisdom. So if you're seeking for healing, before you pray for your healing, what should you pray for? Very good. So if you're seeking a financial miracle, before you ask for the financial miracle, what should you ask for? If you're seeking salvation in your house, before you ask God to save your loved one, what should you ask for? Because the Bible says it is through the chaste conversation, the wise and prudent conversation of the wife, that the husband can be won. It is through wisdom that everything we have and everything we do can expand and grow into the supernatural. But we've got to learn to be passionate pursuers of the wisdom of God. That's why when we begin this, this series in June, and I pray it just grows into its own animal, and we continue after June, and it just keeps on going. We just grow in this thing. But if we're going to pursue wisdom, the first person we ought to go to is King Solomon. Amen. So I want you to write down King Solomon. We're going to get a little bit of history today, a little bit of history about who Solomon was. In fact, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings. 1 Kings. Come on in and nestle in wherever you want to. 1 Kings, chapter number 3. Everybody say, The Preacher's Apprentice. The preacher's apprentice. Now, keep, keep your finger right there in 1 Kings. And, and go to Ecclesiastes. It goes, it goes Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. I, wa I want you to see first how Solomon identifies himself before we go through the history of his life and we talk about what he accomplished, what he experienced, not only his successes but also his failures. I want you to see how he identifies himself, and he does it again and again, but we see it here in Ecclesiastes. Say the name of that book with me. Ecclesiastes. Solomon wrote three books. He wrote Song of Solomon, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. Did you get that class? What are the three books that Solomon wrote? Song of Solomon, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. Now, according to Hebrew scholars and Hebrew rabbis, Every book of the Bible is holy, but if every book of the Bible is holy, the Song of Solomon is considered by Jewish scholars and rabbis to be the holiest of holies. It is considered to be the most holy book in the entirety of the Bible, and it is probably the least read book by Christians in the entirety of the Bible. Isn't that something? 
It is the most holy book because it portrays to us an illustration, a parable, an image of our soul's relationship with God Almighty. When you read about the love affair of that bride and that woman with her lover, it is talking about your soul and how your soul, Solomon is speaking of himself and how his soul longed after God as the deer pants for the water brook. He learned that from his father. Now, in Ecclesiastes, look at this. He said, verse 1, The words of the preacher. Everybody say preacher. Preacher. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. Now, those are interesting words. The words of the preacher. Now, the word preacher there, it actually means, in the Hebrew, it means proverb monger. I like that. The preacher is a proverb monger. Everybody say, we need more preachers. And I hope every preacher is listening to me right now. God called you to preach. He didn't call you to administrate. He didn't call you to manage. He called you to preach. And if you're preaching once a week, an hour a week, you might need to rethink what God's called you to do. God has called you to be a preacher of the gospel. Not allow your own insecurities to abdicate that responsibility to other people. No, you're a preacher. A proverb monger. Oh, I like that. The word itself, Ecclesiastes, this is so fascinating to me. Ecclesiastes is a Greek or Latin deviation of the actual title of the book. But Ecclesiastes, if you remember our study of the ecclesia, do you remember our study of the ecclesia, the called out ones, the ones who have been called out and separated by the king for a specific purpose? Well, Ecclesiastes, we see that same word being used, but it is not the called out ones, it is the one doing the calling out. That's what Ecclesiastes means. He is calling out the remnant. He is standing and gathering a solemn assembly of people who are passionate and hungry for wisdom. Just like in his book of Proverbs, wisdom is crying in the street. It is ecclesia. It is is ecclesiastes. It is calling for an assembly of people who are truly passionate about the wisdom of God. Isn't that something? And so he identifies himself, and maybe we'll get back to that tonight. I'm not going to rush or hurry this thing at all. We've got all month to get through it. Now go back to 1 Kings. Go back to 1 Kings. We're going to do a quick run through. And when I say quick, that's the preacher's definition of quick. Remember, I'm a proverb monger. I'm looking for proverbs in every single thing. That's what you're going to be doing when you leave here tonight. You're going to be looking for proverbs. Your assignment over the next month is to search for proverbs. I'm going to give you a worksheet before we leave here tonight. And on one side of the worksheet, it'll say Solomon's Proverbs. And every day... You're going to write one proverb that's jumped off the page and grab you. And you say, that's for me. You're going to write every day or every other day will be fine for me. You can do every day or every other day. And then right next to Solomon's proverb, you're going to write my proverb. That in that same day, what you learned, what information you received, what wisdom you gleaned, what divine nugget have you gotten from your day that if you had a child and you were imparting some wisdom or someone who needed, what would you say to them from what you've learned? We're going to become proverb you ready for it? Yes. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a proverb monger. Now, most of you know that Solomon came from greatness. Solomon, his father, David, the Bible said Saul slayed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. And Solomon watched his father through his triumphs and through his failures, yet through it all, God still honored his father, David. What, what an amazing victory that is all by itself, that after so many failures and so many faults and so many things that he did wrong, God still honored him. And so Solomon, at 12 years of age, is now coming to the throne, 12 years old. Remember when Jesus was in the temple confounding the teachers? He was 12 years old. Comes before them, 12 years of age, and he cries out. He's just so insecure, totally unable and unequipped for the task he has in front of him. And that's where we find ourselves here in 1 Kings Chapter number 3, and look at verse 5. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, 
Ask what I shall give thee. How'd you like God to show up at your house and ask you that? Twelve, now, he's 12 years of age. And Solomon goes on, go to verse number 9, and we see what he asks for. Give therefore thy servant, look at this, an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said unto him, Now because you asked for this thing, and you did not ask for long life, nor for riches for yourself, you didn't ask for the life of your enemies, but you asked for yourself understanding to discern judgment, behold, I have done according to your words. And then he goes on to say, And I'm going to give you all those things you didn't ask for. Now, we always say, yes, amen, Solomon asked for wisdom. But what is wisdom? Wisdom means a million different things to a million different people, depending on where you were raised and how you were raised. But as you notice when we read that text, nowhere does it say wisdom. We have here the true meaning of wisdom. But what is it? An understanding heart. Here's what true wisdom is. A hearing heart. Get it down. Never forget it. True wisdom is what? A your ability to hear. Now I want you to pay very close attention. Because if wisdom comes from your ability to hear, that must mean that you must position yourself under a voice. Wisdom requires a mentor. Of necessity, if you want to receive wisdom, you must have a mentor. So, if you are to seek wisdom, if wisdom is the principal thing, if wisdom is the first thing you are to seek, then if you're seeking healing, you're supposed to first ask for That means you're supposed to seek a mentor. This is where the disconnect comes in. Now, God talks to us many ways. We can hear God many ways. The first way we hear God is right here. This is the first way we hear God. Everybody say word. The first means through which we hear God, and it's very important you get it in this order. The first means in which we hear God is by His Word, not by divine revelation, you charismaniacs. Listen to me. It is not by prophecy, not by the gifts of the Spirit. It is not by any other supernatural means. It is by this book. God's not going to do anything apart from this book. I thought I'd get an amen in this Pentecostal church. He's not going to do anything outside of this book. Everything he's going to do is going to be in this book. This is the basis for hearing God. Now, the next way God talks to you, he will use his word, but then he will talk to you through your conscience. Through your conscience. Now, why is conscience number two? Because most of you don't know the difference between your squirrely brain and your spirit on the inside of you. How do I know? Is that me or is that God? Well, then you go back to number one. Does it line up with the word? Because your crazy self will always choose the path of least resistance. And you will feel like your conscience is being violated. But what it is, is your pride. When you study history, more tragedy has come to people's lives through simple pride than anything else on the face of the planet. Prideful. So God will talk to you through your conscience. So when you hear something in your conscience come up in your spirit, his spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, when you hear something like that, confirm it with the word. The third way he talks to us is through his servants. Now, this is the primary means through which he will get revelation to you. This is not separate from this. Nor is it separate from this. For if someone who is a servant of God says something that violates your conscience or is contrary to the word, you are not obligated to listen to that individual. Right? Now, you'll grow in this. Most folks are so weak spiritually they can't hear this. And they've spent no time in the word so they don't know what this says. So all they have is this. 
And as a result, they've been disappointed, they've been taken advantage of, and we've reached a point in the body of Christ where we had a lot of people with no word and no ability to access the, the voice of their conscience and that have been so disappointed by servants that they've just cut the whole thing off that mentorship has now just been thrown out. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 2. Solomon's success was not based on his wisdom. It was based on his pursuit of wisdom. God loved Solomon not because he was smart, but because he was, he was passionate about getting wisdom. That was the secret of Solomon's success. The secret of Solomon's success was that he was passionate about pursuing wisdom. He was willing to show up on a Sunday night to learn a little something, to grow in his life. He was willing to go beyond what normal people were willing to do in order to access the wisdom of God. So it wasn't that he had wisdom, it was that he pursued wisdom. Because you don't have wisdom. You pursue wisdom. Whatever wisdom you had yesterday ain't going to help you today unless you are pursuing wisdom today. And wisdom, my dear brother and sister, must be pursued. It's not going to show up in your house and say, ta-da. It's hiding. The Bible says that it is the wisdom, even the hidden wisdom, 1 Corinthians, which God ordained before the foundation of the world unto your glory. Everybody say, it's hidden. hidden. We talked about a few services ago that miracles are constantly coming at you or past you. And you only qualify for what you see. Every day, hundreds of miracles are coming at you and they are going past you and you're only able to access the ones you see, the ones you recognize. Wisdom gives you the ability to see and to recognize the miracles that are coming. They, it, it opens your eyes. But you've got to get passionate about pursuing wisdom. And here's what he said here in Proverbs chapter number 2. My son... If you will receive my word, now I want you to circle the word if, I want you to highlight it, I want you to write it in big bold letters in your notes, I want you to get that word because this is the hardest thing you will ever do in your life, is position yourself to receive the wisdom of God. The most assaulted and attacked relationship you will ever have in your life is the relationship between a mentor and an apprentice. What do we call people who are passionate about seeking wisdom? We've got several words to describe them. Protege, apprentice, ward, trainee, pupil, cadet, student. Those are words that describe someone who is passionate about pursuing wisdom. Do these words describe you? Or are you too prideful? Everybody say protege. protege. Everybody say disciples. disciples. Did you know the Bible says in the Great Commission, a central part of the Christian faith, this is going to rock your world, Matthew 28, Mark chapter 16, we see Jesus say, go into all the world and make disciples. Preach the gospel to every nation and make disciples. Everybody say make disciples. Make disciples. He did not say win souls. Nowhere did he ever say, win souls. The Great Commission is not to win souls. The Great Commission is today what it was then and what it has always been. Even in the Old Covenant, it was to declare the word of God. And results, forgive my language, be damned. You don't consider what they're going to say and how they're going to respond. Your job is to preach his word. And souls will get saved. And disciples, look at this. He didn't say disciple men. That would indicate that it is my job to disciple you. No. He said make a disciple. Meaning Birth an individual who by their works and their nature and their actions are described themselves as a disciple based on what they do, not what you do. 
Did it say win souls? Because what the church is doing right now is we're on this massive sales campaign to get as many people in the church as we possibly can. And I don't want to preach this message ahead of time, but it is destroying the church. Look at what's happening in the immigration area of America today. America is about to lose its entire identity because of allowing anyone and everyone to come in. And so now educational standards are going to go down. Wages are going to go down. Everything's going to, now, now, now transfer that spiritually to the church. The church, just get everybody and anybody in here. Just everybody and anybody. Let all who will. No. Let all who are passionate. Let all who are hungry. Let all who are going to add to the fire and not take away come. I'm going to give you two statements. One of them is true. One of them is true. Two statements, one of them is true. The first statement is, go to church, excuse me, have a church, statement number one. Statement number two, have a pastor. Only one of them is explicitly instructed for you in the Bible. Have a pastor. Didn't tell you to go to church. You're supposed to be the church. He said, have a pastor. Have a mentor. That means become a protege, a disciple. A, a disciple is defined not by what I do, but how you respond to what I do. That's right. That's a disciple. And so the Bible doesn't say go out and win souls. It says make disciples. Do you see quality over quantity being expressed in the heart of God? Go out and make disciples. Go out and preach the word. Because here's what happens. If you're focused on souls being one, you will alter the word. But if you focus on preaching the word, souls will be one. And we watch the church. I've, I've seen it. I've seen it since I've been in the kingdom of God over the past decade especially. How can we best evangelize? What's the best way we can present it? How, how can we best knock on doors and talk to people? What's the best way we can do it? To get them to say yes to Jesus. And so we're constantly changing. And, well, we can't say this because that would be offensive. And we can't present it this way. And here's a way we can have this, and it'll look really good, and they'll like it better. And we want to reach people who wouldn't normally come to church. Why do I want to reach people who wouldn't want to come to church? Isn't that false advertising? Y'all are getting quiet in here. Well, we're going we're gonna to do this over here, and we're going to meet at the movie theater, because there's nothing, nothing wrong with being in the movie theater, and I'm not talking about any particular church. If I had my, I'd love to be in a movie theater. I'd love popcorn. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the mentality and the motivation behind it. I'd be in a movie theater tomorrow if I had the opportunity. It'd be just fine with me. But I'm talking about the motivation of if we do it in a movie theater or an event in a movie theater or a fellowship in a movie theater, we'll get people who wouldn't normally come to church to come to the movie theater. So you're getting them to come to the movie theater so that you can convince them to come to your church, but you want them to come to the movie theater because they wouldn't normally come to church. How are we exhausting ourselves trying to figure out a way to trick people to getting into our church? Y'all are quiet in here tonight. I'm telling you. We need a revangelization of the body of Christ. We, we need to get back into preaching the gospel. We need to get back to preaching to our people the word. Because they're about as dumb as a bed bug in a rug. I don't know. <laughs> Ask yourself, am I a disciple? Am I a protege? Am I an apprentice? I know I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's my service. I can do whatever I want to do. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. There are two ways you can learn in your life. Two ways of learning. Number one, you can learn through mistakes. Or, you can learn through a mentor. Two ways to learn. Number one, mistakes. Number two, kids, listen very carefully. You're still with your parents. Your parents are trying to help you. They've been there. They've seen it. They've done that. 
if you will listen, you can avoid the mistakes and you can avoid the pain. Well, they don't know what I'm going through. No, you're stupid. They know exactly what you're going through. They do. Your brain just isn't fully formed yet. Your brain damaged. If you would just listen to them, God uses experience to teach fools who refuse to sit at the foot of a mentor. I love that season just for a second. Well, they're just going to have to learn by experience. Well, they, you will unless you have a mentor. You can avoid the pain. The fifth commandment in the Ten Commandments, the first of all the Ten Commandments that deal with our relationship with humanity, says, honor your father and mother. Now look at this, that your life may be long upon the earth. The first commandment dealing with our relationship with humanity is a commandment concerning spiritual authority over your life. Divine authority. Now what we have in the body of Christ today is the hippie generation of the church. Remember the hippie generation of the 60s and 70s? Why were they like that? Because their parents were the World War II generation. And they didn't play. They went through the depression. Huh? They were hard and they were stern. We're not going to be that hard. We're not going to be that stern. So they rebelled in the other direction, didn't they? Free love, man. Peace, love, recycle. <laughs> That's what they wanted. Free. Now, they're all in office right now. They're all running the nation right now, those hippies. They're all running the whole thing right now. But then we had a generation, we had a revival in the church. We had the Jesus movement, the word of faith movement, the healing revival. And it exploded on the scene, and we were diligent about Quoting the word, speaking the word, and declaring it over your family, declaring it over your house, laying hands on the sick, and watching them recover. And now we have an entire church that's grown up. And it, well, it don't take all that. You, know, you don't have to get it. It'll take all that. Yeah, it does. Well, look, I'm able to accomplish all this over here without doing that. No, you are standing on the shoulders of those who went before you while spitting on their memory. The only reason you're able to accomplish what you're able to accomplish with your, with your laissez-faire Christianity is because the diligence and the prayers of those saints are still going and they're still pushing you. But one day, like Samson, you will shake yourself and not even realize that the Spirit of God has departed from you. Y'all getting this? Solomon was, a, Solomon was a man who understood what it meant to be a protege who understood what it meant in his life. He understood what it meant to be a disciple, to be an apprentice, even to his father and even to the prophets that were in the house of God. When he established his throne, he allowed the Sanhedrin, 71 of them, to sit, the council, around his throne, to study the word and to study the, the, the objects of the law that were being laid out among the Hebrew people. He was a wise man who understood the value of wisdom. Twelve years of age, came on the scene, God gave him wisdom. You know, the first act of his wisdom was with the baby. You remember the story of the baby? The baby, you know, two mothers saying, the baby's mine. And Solomon said, tell you what, cut that baby in half, and we'll give each one of them half. Because he knew the true mother would be willing to sacrifice her own desire and her own needs to be the mother so that the life of the child could be preserved. And his wisdom spread across the whole world. Everybody was sending him gifts and wanted to see this tremendous wisdom of such a young man who was accomplishing. Had an amazing military. He built, the, he built his palace, which was phenomenal. He had a throne, the likes of which no one had ever seen. When the Queen of Sheba saw his throne, she fainted. Six steps walking up to his throne. His throne was not just beautiful because of the gems that were used and the items that were used. It was a mechanism. It moved. Every step of his throne represented a different animal, was a different animal. And when he would step on one, it would move and take him to the next step. And he would step on the other, and it would move and take him to the next step. And people were bewildered and baffled by what he was able to accomplish. That's Solomon. How many of you want to be like Solomon? Man, let me tell you a few more things about him before we get to chapter 12 here. It had been 480 years since they came out of Egypt and there was no real temple yet. And God was honoring Solomon with the ability to build the temple. And so he spent seven years with nearly 100,000 workers constructing the temple. Dedicated to God. 
Seven years, 100,000 people nonstop working. And it was said during those seven years, there wasn't the sound of metal that was heard on the Temple Mount. You know what that means? The only reason you need metal is when you're putting the pieces together so that if something doesn't fit quite right, you can hammer it in. But they constructed it off site and they did it with such brilliant architecture that when they brought the pieces up to the temple and they put them in place, they all fit perfectly and you never had to hear the sound of metal on the temple as God blessed their efforts and gave them wisdom in everything that they did. Are you learning something you didn't know here tonight? Ah, it's good, isn't it? Constructed that temple, I need to tell you this. Seven years was up. They're going to bring in the Ark of the Covenant now. It's going to be completed. He is now walking with the priests as they bring the Ark of the Covenant into this amazing construct that no one had ever seen the likes of it before. And as they're approaching the temple, something supernatural happens. The doors close and lock by themselves. This is not good. You've got hundreds of thousands of people watching. We've been waiting seven years for this moment. And now the Lord God Almighty has closed and locked the doors himself and will not let them in. And so Solomon begins to pray. And he prays and he prays and he prays every prayer he could possibly imagine to pray. And nothing happened until. Now, are you ready to see how you can get access to a greater glory and a greater blessing? Listen to how he prayed. He said, Lord, for David, my father's sake. And the doors opened. You will not be able to move into a greater glory and a greater blessing until you acknowledge the mentors that have brought you to where you are today. God will not bring you, not allow you, until you understand that it is through mentorship that you can accomplish greatness and nothing else. The only difference between your present right now and your future will be your mentor. That's it. Everybody say, Lord, open the door for David's sake. No, David was, was an adulterer. A murderer. The imperfections of your mentor does not make them irrelevant. God hides his most precious gifts in his most marred vessels so that only the truly passionate qualify to receive those gifts. God uses imperfect vessels to grate away and scrape away and chip away at your own pride and your own flesh. He will use that mentor until it, remember, your ability to hear. That's what wisdom is. At what point do you stop hearing? He will, he, God has me do it all the time. I will preach and I will preach and I will preach and I'm looking for that wall where you stop hearing so I can start beating on that wall. I keep pushing and I keep pushing and I keep prodding. I keep trying to find the place where you get offended or where you draw the line or where you've been hurt in the past and you say, I'm not going to allow that to happen to me and I just, I find it, that's where we need to be and I keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Because if I can break down the wall that's keeping you from hearing, I put you in a place where you are an apprentice and a protege and those are the people God loves. God loves disciples. Not rogue Christians. Well, I'm going to do it my way. Not around here, you're not. Wish I had a microphone I could knock on. Not around here, you're not. Well, I, you know, I just want to be led. No. We don't need your lead around here. No. Well, you're just going to, I'm listening for the Lord. Well, we don't need your Lord around here. If your Lord is telling you to do something other than what your authority told you to do, you don't have the same Lord we do. You've got a different one. Now, if someone tells you to do something immoral, illegal, or unethical, that's an entirely different thing. We're not talking about that. We're talking about God placing an authority in your life, and the sole purpose of that authority is to make you uncomfortable. Your friends are comfortable with where you are. 
Your mentor is comfortable with where you're going. Your friends are your cheerleaders. Your mentor is your coach. Your coach doesn't tell you what you're doing right. Your mentor tells you what you're doing wrong. And that's what you need. If you want your tomorrow to be different from today, you don't, have, you don't need the applause. You need, you don't, Jesus, Peter walked on the water. Walked on the water. No man had ever accomplished a feat like that. And Jesus said, where's your faith? Why you got so much unbelief in you? Not congratulations, Peter, you did real good. Now next time, here's what we need to do. But why is it that that's what we need in the body of Christ today? That we got to butter you up before we can tell you what you need to fix. Not going to do it around here. There's not enough time. Jesus is coming. I ain't got time to butter you up and make you feel good about you. I don't have time for that. Your mentor sees the pain you will cause in the future with your current activity. You don't see it. Think about it. If, you, if, you, if you've been a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You can see your child and you can see them doing something that right now is benign. Right now it's producing no negative results. But you know if that continues, it's going to bring destruction in their life in the future. They can't see it. Only you can see it. And that's what your pastor does. Your pastor sees the pain you will cause in your future by your current mentality. But you don't see it. There are people in this church, leaders in this church, that are not ready to be able-bodied ministers. Now, are not ready to step up to the next level, but they think they are ready. And there are people who think they are not ready to step up to the next level, and they are ready. There are people who are presumptuous and think they deserve this and they deserve that, and they're not going to get it, and then they'll be disappointed and offended unless they get a hold of this teaching. Then there are people who think they don't deserve this and they don't deserve that, and they're going to be elevated. y'all expected to get when y'all came out tonight or we doing all right okay just checking if God didn't use imperfect people who's he going to use <laughs> I just messed you up right there well they got it. I don't know I don't like the way they did this I don't like the way you talk about the way we did this how about that at ECC we have a three-step process to have all of your qualms and problems taken care of. Any organization worth its salt has this three-step process. You go to Burger King, you, you have a form. You can submit a file. If there's a problem, you can submit that form. It goes in the suggestion box. And we can put a suggestion box back there if it'll help you out. Here's the three-step process. If you see something or feel something you don't like, step number one, shut your mouth. <laughs> step number one. Well, I just needed to share this with my friend. No, you violated step number one. Now you're in, now you're in a rebellion. Step number one, shut your mouth. Step number two, pray. God forbid. And then once you've prayed, step number three, refer to step number one. If you learned that in your marriage as well, your marriage would be better off. Stop trying to make your spouse do something and talk about how bad they are and how good. No, no. Now listen, the Bible says submit yourselves one to another. When I said over here one of the ways God talks to us as servants, that's not just your pastor. That's your brother and sister in Christ. You're supposed to submit one to another and honor one another. How do you respond when your brother or sister comes to you and says, we need help ushering tonight? Well, I've been ushering and I've ushered all I need to usher and I, you know, I just want to do something else. I'm just tired of doing that. Now, if I would have asked you, you would have said something different. Oh, yeah, Pastor, anything I can do. Mm -hmm. Here's what you need to consider. Think of the person that you honor the least in the house of God. And imagine them asking you to do the thing you detest the most. How would you respond? That'll tell you whether or not you have a submitted heart and the heart of an apprentice or a protege. Is that too real? I don't know. Write, write that assignment down because I want you to consider it and really take some time to meditate on it. Think of the person you honor the least, that you like the least. And I mean, you don't like everybody. <laughs> I don't know, around here you might. If they're sitting next to you, don't, just don't say anything. Don't look at them. <laughs> Think of the person you like the least and imagine them asking you to do the thing you detest the most. How would you respond? Imagine the position in the house of God, something that you take pride in, something you enjoy doing, and imagine the person you think the least worthy to do it, taking your place and you sitting out for a few months. How would you feel about that? Huh? 
That shows, now pride, that's pride, you see. That's what that is, it's pride. Well, I don't understand why they get to do that and I don't get to do it. Because you're prideful, you just found out why. Your response just showed you why. You don't think I see it, but I see it. Uh huh. Because I'm a mentor. I'm not your teacher. I'm not your cheerleader. My job is to get you to heaven. My job. That's a serious job. I'm going to be accountable for whether or not you get there and how you get there and what kind of reward you get when you get there. It's my job. I take it seriously. I might not have as big a crowd when we come back next Sunday. I don't know. The real ones will be back. I'll tell you that right now. When we're learning from our mentors, we learn from their pain as much as we learn from their miracles. The masses hear about the miracles, but if you're being mentored, if you're a protege, you hear about the pain. That's going to be one of the benefits of coming on Sunday nights. I'm going to be able to share with you real things. We can be real and talk about some things that you may not hear in other places and other times. How are we doing on time so far, by the way? What, what time is it? Oh, all right, I got a few more minutes. You want a few more minutes? Yeah. All right. Here we go. Hmm. You in Ecclesiastes? If you're not, you're never going to get there. This is going to rock your world right here. This, this, this clarified so much for me when I got a hold of this. You're going to like it. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Look at verse number 9. Of course, we have Song of Solomon was written by Solomon in his younger years. Proverbs written throughout his life. The greatest thoughts that ever lighted upon his brain written down in the book of Proverbs. That you're going to be reading now one chapter at least a day to find one proverb in that chapter that just jumps out at you. And um, then later in his life after he experienced, you know, he, he got a hold of some women that led him astray. No, they didn't lead him astray. He led himself astray. But you have to understand, everybody knows Solomon had all these wives, you know. He had about, I don't know, 700 wives and 300 concubines. Goodness. And people say, why would he do that? Well, one of the reasons why he did that, he was the first king to bring peace to Israel ever. It was the prayer of his father. And now he's got this pressure of preserving the one thing they've never seen in hundreds of years. And the way you do that is by marrying king's daughters. So you can maintain peace with kingdoms. That's the reason why he did it. Now, God didn't like that he did it. It wasn't okay that he did it. But that's the reason why he did it. And in his effort, in his mind, he's trying to maintain peace with all of these nations and all of these people. And as he's doing it, he really does care for these people. He really does care for these nations and the people that are representing them in his palace. And so he wants to care for them and he wants them to be comfortable. So he makes some kind of quasi-commit to Judaism, uh, but he, he allows them to worship their own gods at the same time. And that compromise itself corrupted his own mind and his own heart, allowing all of these influences into his life. You see, when you're a protege... You have to learn to be able to receive from your mentor in a way that shatters your idea of the entire world with no compromise. You've got to understand that when you're entering into a protege mentorship relationship, an apprenticeship, that your mentor is going to have a view of the world radically different from yours. And if you're not careful, you will get easily offended when they begin to chip away at your thin veneer of wisdom of how you look at things socially, economically, governmentally, how you look at everything, your mentor will have a different perspective. And if you're not careful, you'll just look at the bumper sticker and you think, well, that's the same as this. And you don't realize there's great wisdom to what they believe and why they believe it and why they hold to this. And if you'll grab a hold of it, you'll save lives. You may even look at some hard-line positions a mentor takes as being intolerant. But you haven't seen what they've seen. You haven't prayed for 100,000 people. You haven't been in different nations all over the world. You haven't experienced, I ought to do a book. I ought to do a devotional book on the people I've had the opportunity to sit with and receive from. It, I, I could probably do a devotional that would fit every week of the year, if not every day of the year, of these amazing people of, that I've had the opportunity to sit and not just meet, to sit and talk to and tell you what I learned from Colin Powell. 
tell you what I learned when I sat down and talked to Rudy, Rudy Giuliani. What did I have the ability to learn when I asked Ann Coulter to ask me to marry her? That's another story all by itself. What did I learn when I met Big Glenn Beck? What did I learn from that? What did I learn when I was able to speak with Mike Huckabee on several occasions? What was I able to glean from that? When I was able to have breakfast with Rick Perry, what was I able to learn from that? Or with Kenneth Copeland, what was I able to learn from those situations? Are, are you? There's a wealth of wisdom. So don't just assume you know what I believe or why I believe what I believe. Because everything that I do is to preserve life. Not to ostracize anyone. Not to offend anyone. Not to condemn anyone. I'm out to save people's lives. That's what I'm out to do. I care about people's well-being. So if I take a stance on a particular issue that's opposite yours, you might need to ask me some questions. I might be able to help you. Now, you hear? Chapter 12 and verse 9. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge, yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. So he's been through all the disappointments, all the pain. And that's what the book of Ecclesiastes is about. And these are his final thoughts here. Verse 10. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words. And that which was written was upright, even words of truth. Verse 11. The words of the wise are as goads. Let me give you the translation of that. Cattle prod. The words of the wise are like cattle prods. That's what Sunday nights are going to be like. Cattle prods. And as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. <laughs> I, I, we'll talk more about that next week. Now look at verse 12. This is going to be very helpful. And you, you have to understand my spirit now. I'm not going to qualify every statement I make, but you have to understand that everything I say, even when it's radical, there's, there's a depth behind it and a love behind it and a compassion behind it. There's a nuance behind it. There's a balance behind it. But hear what I'm about to say. Hear what Solomon's about to say. And further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books. There is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. I want to read verses 11 and 12 again, and I want you to hear it, and then we'll go over it. The words of the wise are his goads, and his nails fastened by the masters of, the, of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further by these, my son, be admonished of making many books, there is no end, and of much study, there is weariness in the flesh. What he's saying is, look at this, be leery of listening to more than one shepherd, and don't believe everything you read. Now, this is a word for this generation, if I've ever heard one. Because we have so much access to so much good stuff. It is good stuff. But the Bible says one cannot serve two masters. You will wind up loving one and hating the other. And with the internet and with radio and with television, we have access to phenomenal teaching. And you should certainly avail yourself to it. But hear the words of the prophet. Be leery of having more than one shepherd. Because it will corrupt your ability to hear. When I am preparing for a new year and I'm wanting to hear the word of God for the new year, I don't, I don't look at any article. I don't look at what any man of God is saying. I don't, I don't read anything on the internet. I stay off Facebook. I don't watch Christian television because I want to hear what God is saying first without being corrupted by anyone else. Not corrupted, just distracted. Because whenever you hear something, it will taint the way you hear the next thing. So I'm not saying that the other things, neither is Solomon. I'm not saying the other things out there. I'm just telling you Christians today are confused and they don't even realize it. So that when they come to church where their real shepherd is, who is the guardian of their souls, they say something and it doesn't stick in their mind like a nail. It is, doesn't have the proper effect that a cattle prod would have because they've been so consumed with hearing all kinds of other things. Other ministers and other things which are fantastic and are wonderful. I'm not saying don't listen. I'm saying be, I'm just, I'm just quoting the verse. Be leery. 
be leery. He's not saying don't study. But if you study the words of your pastor, it's different than studying the words of somebody you saw on television. It's just, it's just different. And, and, and listen, I know some of the people that are on television. And I can vouch for some of them, and I can tell you that some of them you probably shouldn't listen to. But I wouldn't tell you that because I, I don't want to put anybody down. That's not my job. My job is to give you truth. And through that truth, you're able to discern what you pick up and what you lay down. I can tell you this. I probably, I probably went years listening to no other minister other than my pastor. None. And you know what that gave me? Such extreme focus and clarity. I could hear God's voice so clear. It astounded me when people wondered how they could hear the voice of God. They just didn't know how to. As you, as you consolidate and condense things down, as he says, to one shepherd, one mentor. For your spiritual life, you need one mentor. Now, your goals determine your mentors. If, if, you, if your goal is to lose 50 pounds, I'm not your mentor. Nick Little might need to be your mentor. Nick can get you in the weight room and just uh, impress the, the bejesus out of you. <laughs> he can show you how to do it. From what I understand, you broke the state record. Is that right this, this past week? Broke the state record in, in powerlifting on his age and his weight. We got a celebrity in our midst tonight. <laughs> and he was only able to do it through the wise instruction of his sister who's sitting next to him. But your goals determine your mentors. If you want to be a culinary expert, then you're going to need a mentor for that. But I'm talking about spiritual things. We're talking about the shepherd, the pastor. Be leery of having more than one shepherd. Just because it produces many voices, hard to distinguish. Having one shepherd brings clarity and brings direction. So over the next month, we're going to determine to bear down on this. And we're going to determine every single one of us to become the greatest protégés and apprentices we could ever have. Solomon's purpose in his life, the sole reason for knowledge. I forget what movie we were watching. I think it was Lucy. Lucy is a movie about this, this woman who, through some bad means, is able to access 100% of her brain. And she contacts this professor to ask, what do I do with all this knowledge? And the point he made there and I don't recommend the movie. I'm just saying the point they made was actually pretty good. The purpose of knowledge has always been to pass it down. Solomon understood that. And as a result, he wrote Song of Solomon, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. So over the next month, every single day of your life, every single day of your life for the next month, I want you to read one chapter in the book of Proverbs. One chapter. When you leave here tonight, we're going to put a sheet in your hand. And it's going to have, I believe, is it 20? 20 spaces so that you could, do, you, you could write in every other day, whatever jumps out at you. So when you come in next week, you need at least five of the, of the sections filled in. That'll be 10 sections, Solomon's Proverbs and your Proverbs. So you're going to write down one proverb, one saying out of that chapter that jumped out at you, just one. If this will take you five minutes, just one. And then by, at the end of the day, you're going to write down your own proverb right beside it, what you learned that day. And what you're going to find is as you begin thinking about it, it's just, like, it's just like saving money. It's so hard to save money until you start saving money. And then you get in the habit of saving money. And it's just easy. You can't imagine not saving money. And all those years you weren't saving it, you thought you could never do it. And now you just you can't imagine not saving money. Maybe y'all don't have that testimony. It's like giving offerings. When you plan, when you prepare to give an offering every Sunday night, when you plan for it throughout the week, it is so easy to find that offering. So it just, it just falls out of heaven because you're aware, your eyes are open, and you only qualify for what you see. But you're looking for it because you know Sunday night's coming, so I'm going to get an offering in my hand. The same is true with wisdom. As you begin thinking about wisdom and pondering it and reading those, that, those Proverbs in the morning, throughout the day, things are just going to come up in you because you're now looking for that wisdom. It's going to start coming out of you, and it's going to change your life forever. Are you glad you came tonight? Amen. Are you glad you came? Yes. Hallelujah. Well, let's get our Sunday night offering in your hand. Those of you online, if you've received anything from the Lord tonight, I want you to get an offering in your hand. We're going to pray over it and believe God for you to have a transformation of wisdom in your life. Amen? Get something in your hand right now. We're going to pray over it. We're going to believe God for a mighty breakthrough of wisdom and mentorship this month. Whew, that's a lot of information, isn't it? 
That's a lot of good stuff right there. We're going to have to go over it again and again and again. But we're going to get it. I want to thank those of you that are tuning in in uh, Montana. Is it Montana we got folks tuning in, Tara? Uh, Or Minnesota. Montana or Minnesota? Minnesota, folks tuning in. Hello, Minnesota. Hello, Fargo, wherever that is. (laughs) Hello, Georgia. Americans, so terrible at geography. Hello, Georgia, it's good to see you. Hello, Ohio, it's good to see you. Hello, Florida, it's good to see you. Pakistan, it's good to see you. Tasmania, if you're tuning in, it's good to see you. It's awesome what we're able to do here whenever we gather together. Amen? Let me see this sheet of paper right here. This is what it'll look like. Now, if you're watching at home, you can just make one of these yourself. One sheet of paper, draw a line down the middle on one side. Solomon's wisdom on the other side is your own wisdom. And it's two sides. It's 20 days of wisdom. And you're going to bring it in with you every time you come. Or we can email it to you. If you go online, email us, let us know you want it. We'll send it to you. Let's pray over this offering tonight. Father, we come before you now in the name of Jesus. And we sow into this because we know the anointing we sow into is the anointing we receive. We sow into wisdom and we believe that we're going to receive the wisdom that you said you would hold nothing back. You would give us more than enough. So we receive the wisdom of God in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Give as unto the Lord. Thank you for joining us online. We will see you Wednesday night right here at ECC. God bless you. Hallelujah. Y'all glad you came tonight? Hallelujah. Let me see if I got any further announcements for you.